after Benson said he had the mind of a nice child, which I, is, I think is both pejorative but quite charming. <laughs> mm. Well, a very nice child, but he also had a, I mean, children are just as clever as adults, so it's no, uh, it's not a derogatory remark mm. about his intellect, because, um, but uh, the kind of concentration and interest which not all children would have, except, and this is something really worth noticing about him, which is that he, he not only remained a child, but he became an adult very young. I mean, when he was at Eton, his interest in bizarre adult kind of things, the Apocrypha mm. in particular, and something that's not picked up much, which is his curious interest in sadism. I mean, he took, I mean, at the age of 14 or 15, he was taking a great interest in crucifixions and torturings and so on. I mean, they were all academic torturings and crucifixions in uh, apocryphal writings. But he became, he was a little um, adult. It rather reminds me of a remark made by, um, about my preparatory school, which, um, to which um, Tolkien's sons went and Tolkien lived round the corner. And someone commented that the dragon school to which I went was were like the hobbits. They were adults in children's form. They were grown up. They talked in a very pompous, grown up kind of way as children. And M. R. James was like that. If you'd met him at fourteen or fifteen, you would probably have held a conversation which would have surprised you mm. uh, in its adultness. But behind it was this child as well. I wonder though if that. Um is, is that just Monty's version of, of a teenager interested in horror comics? Yeah, he, 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 uh, he had such a uh, specific and curious uh, interest in the biblical apocrypha, but as a teenager, the bits that appeal to him the most are the bits of the most gore in them. Yes, that's a good way to put mm. it, actually. I mean, it might, makes it much more understandable um, and not something peculiar and fetishistical. There is, I mean, most of it is, he uses a mirror technique, it's just occurred to me, that you don't actually see the horrible object that has been dug up or found or haunting. You watch the, you, you hear about the expression mm -hmm. of the person who saw it. Yes. So you imagine how horrible it was through a mirror. But sometimes he, perhaps not needlessly, but certainly um, it's not absolutely necessary, he goes into taking you into the kill. It's like... Um, you know, taking, blooding mm. someone in a fox hunt, you know, your face is rubbed in the gory scene, mm. which is not absolutely necessary. But it suddenly occurs to me that this technique of showing the unspeakable um, is being done exactly, and I don't know whether the parallels are often made, by another great writer, one of the greatest writers in the English language, exact contemporary, um, definitely a homosexual, and that is Saki. Because um, in Shredni Vashta particularly, and in a number of um, Saki stories where uh, strange dogs eat, uh, eat up uh, gypsy children and so on, there's a side, particularly of childhood and of life, below the surface of respectable Edwardian society, which is suddenly opened up. Mm. So what Saki does with his short stories, James does with his ghost stories, just show that our world, it's a kind of golding type thing. Um, uh, our world, which looks so respectable and rational and controllable on the surface, if you just go down a level, we are beasts. Mm -hmm. Do you think, do you think that Monty's um, conservative instincts uh, find their expression in the amount of times his ghost stories are about not meddling? Essentially, uh, you know, no digging here. Uh, the, 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 there'll be some sort of ancient warning not to interfere. And even though it's a thing from the past, is that a sort, do you think that's a sort of expression of his inherently conservative instinct? It could be a conservative instincts, but it could be more a kind of dance of the seven veils idea, which is that breaking through a taboo or a prohibition heightens the tension and the narrative 
strength of a story. It's, um, of course, in Kings, which has the most famous great lawn in, in the Western world, uh, the notice which says, don't walk on the grass, which every day uh, Monty would have walked across that grass, where it said, don't walk on the grass, is a reminder that having something which says, don't walk here, and then walking across it gives you a special <laughs> thrill. So a lot of the short uh, of the ghost stories are really kind of don't walk on the grass because mm. something awful will happen. And of course, at the same time in Cambridge, um, uh, A.A. Milne was, uh, at, along at Trinity or wherever he was, writing about walking on the steps in the pavement where the bears would come out and eat you. You know, our society is built up of grids of things you can do and you can't do. And if you step on the, on the grass or on the squares, something will get you. Mm. So it's a warning to the curious, among other things. I think he might, he didn't get on with Keynes, and there may have been a lot of threats from Keynes. One was obviously the homosexuality, possibly. Second, the economics. I don't suppose it was his favorite subject. Um, and also Keynes uh, clearly disapproved of James's running of the college and thought he was inefficient, which he possibly was. <laughs> and you know, Keynes was a professional um, economist and probably dropped strong hints that the investments could have been better handles. So he felt this young Turk, and it's always threatening to have such a person. Also, there's the intellectualism of Keynes. I, I don't quite know how to handle the argument that A.M.R. James was an anti-intellectual, because many people, he's reputedly um, said, and Benson and others say, he doesn't like ideas. Now, that seems an odd thing to say about an academic, but there is a streak of him in which abstract very abstract ideas. He likes grounded ideas. He likes paleography, he likes history, he likes archaeology. He's at the data end of academic disciplines. He's not at the theoretical physics, mathematics. And I expect he was, uh, like others, uh, horrified by what was happening in the Cavendish Laboratory at the time, all these strange physicists down there. Uh, the troglodytes, as they were known to the <laughs> people like James. They were living in caves and doing absurd things, <laughs> as uh, Cornford put it. So um, there was a threatening new world out there, of which Keynes was one branch. He wasn't a heavy physicist. So he was an intellectual, he was a homosexual, he was a brave a young Turk, and in every way an undermining kind of figure. Mm. All art uh, is effortless, should be effortless. By the time you get to the high le higher levels, you don't know that you're an artist. I mean, if you're thinking of being a pianist or violinist or painter and you're thinking about techniques, you're lost. So by the time he was writing the, his mature ghost stories, he didn't have to think about how he was mm -hmm. doing it. What you have to do to be a great artist like James or Monty is basically to have internalized all the techniques and the message or whatever you want to say and for it to come out with surprise. The great poet W.B. Yeats said that his poetry was in the tip of his pen and I, I think in James probably sat down probably a day before he had to read out one of his and he didn't think about it. He thought, oh gosh, tomorrow I've got to read this thing out. I'll write it. So late into the evening with a glass of wine beside him, he mm. would just write mm. it. And therefore it was artless in a way, but it drew on all the psychological uh, and intellectual resources he had. And it's quite clear that he amassed by that time a vast set of um, techniques or models of ways of doing this. Listening again to his ghost stories, I'm struck by how much of the antiquarian comes into it. What gives it its depth is this very specific illusion. You know, he doesn't say, I was looking at an old manuscript. Yeah. He said, I was looking at Canon so and so's manuscript in 1213, which had come from the Douay apocalypse and had fallen in my hands through the Bodleian Library. I mean, 
you suddenly think, this is it. Mm. I mean, he knows what he's talking about, and it's an exact occasion. It's an exact experience which he's had. So you're led through his scholarship and his, mm. his whole life up to this moment, which feels very real as a result of this. Well, the laugh comes also from laughing at himself, because the characters often a hero of, is not, is often rather a bumbling, not very clever, um, plun, uh, plodding sort of character, who gets mixed up in all this. And when you read it, you're both inside this person's fears and hopes and so on, but you're also the audience watching him as a not entirely commendable and not entirely sensible individual. And you're sort of, so when he stumbles and falls and does stupid things, you're sometimes laughing as the spectator as well as mm. from inside. Mm. I think it's, it's a part of him. I mean, the, the very high, highly honed intellect is left out, but the personal characteristics mm. are probably quite strongly modeled mm. on himself. Well, it is a, a feature of ghost stories. I mean, the great ghost story civilizations of the world are the British, the Chinese, and the Japanese, and maybe there are some others, but I know little more about the Japanese and the Chinese. And there they have the function, one of the functions in rather cu curious functions in Japan and China, is that ghost stories, if they're really good, make you sweat. So they're told in China and Japan when people are very hot, and if you sweat, it helps you to deal with heat. So they tell the ghost stories and you start perspiring and you feel cooler. Now, I can't be said of Cambridge winters that you need that particular treatment, but I think the excitement that comes out of being taken into that horrific world, which many people feel when they watch horror movies and so on, um, is something which seems another dimension of I mean, you can see it in early childhood when I used to read to my grandchildren and I'd read them slightly scary stories, just scary enough so they were slightly scared but not too scary. I could see the enjoyment in them. It's interesting, though, that British society, Chinese, Japanese, generally be characterised as the most reserved and, and actually the, the ghost story flourishes, um, perhaps because being less expressive the, the 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 need for that kind of thing is actually sublimated into stories. That's a very nice connection. I hadn't seen it, and it's it's self-evidently true. Mm. Um, I mean, you can just see it in the hand gestures. I mean, can, you could have a law: countries which throw their hands around when they're talking don't have ghost stories, <laughs> <laughs> or not so many. <laughs> Yes and no. I mean, if he'd been interested in it, we would perhaps also have been surprised. Um, in some ways, it was a very intellectual. You, you can't say that his uh, keeping his distance from it was because it would have lowered his status. I mean, one of his great contemporaries, um, Sir James Fraser, who founded anthropology, had to be very careful of being interest, too interested in anthropology when he was asked at High Table at Trinity whether he'd ever met a native. He had to think and say, God forbid. Because, I mean, meeting, it's all right to write about natives, but mm. to meet a native. Um, and someone might have said, oh, you know, James, I, I gather you not only write about ghosts, but you spend your time in the evenings dabbling with them. Ha, ha, ha. So, but I think the fact that Sidgwick and um, a number of very distinguished philosophers and writers and others were members of the society um, suggests that you know he wouldn't have lost face by being a member of it. So it is a bit puzz puzzling. Um, the fact that he didn't take holy orders might be a clue. I, I think he was ambivalent all his life about whether there was another world, another life, God, so on. He never committed himself. He kept, and that is one of the interesting things about the ghost stories, because they take you to the edge of belief, but they don't thrust you into it. Mm. 
So you start always with extreme rationality. Everything is calm and in the light of ordinary day, and then it gets odder and odder. And then you're left. You, you know, he says, well, you can believe it if you like. Mm. And so I think he kept the, his options open. Um, he was always doubting. Uh, he was, um, Bertrand Russell said, the greatest invention of the 20th century was the suspended judgment. <laughs> and though it wasn't invented then, I think Monty was a great example of the suspended judgment. Mm. And I think probably the Society for Suspe uh, uh, sorry, the S Society for Psychical Research didn't suspend judgment enough for, for his point of view. He wasn't sure he believed in that stuff, and he wasn't sure he wanted to start down the track of trying to prove whether it was true or not. These guys can do it if they want, mm. but like the, the odd people over in the Cavendish laboratory, that's their business, not mine. Um, so he doesn't want to be sucked into that particular whirlpool. I think so, because people might have then said they were some kind of propaganda for mm. the psychical research. Also, there were these scandals. I mean, there was uh, some famous medium, I've forgotten what her name was, who was alluring to all the Cambridge and other, and she was outed. I mean, it was shown that it was a, a fraud, and Madame Blavatsky and all the rest of it. So I think he was wary, um, perhaps not rightly, but he was quite wary. I mean, what, what really interests me about the whole thing is that the movement of psychical research came out of a real need, which was shown by the fact that A.R. Wallace, the co-discoverer of evolution, was also very interested in psychical research. Um, and that is that God is dead. I mean, Darwin has shown that a ration, rational people can't really believe in God in the way that they did anyway, according to Richard Dawkins. Um, therefore, what are we going to do? Is there some other belief, thing, system. belief system? And it's clear that for Sidgwick and others, psychical research was searching for something other. Mm. Um, and I think M. R. James's ghost stories come out of that as another manifestation of it, because for him also, God is not clearly alive. Um, and therefore, um, he's, he's a parallel movement to the psychical research, but not exactly the same. But I think another great branch which has always fascinated me is, is children's stories. I mean, that is the beginning of Alice in Wonderland um, and the, the great tradition, or Beatrix Potter and so on. I mean, that whole fantasy world that it ends up with Harry Potter, um, which is earlier, but makes the late Victorians, the Edwardians in the middle 20th century, the greatest period of children's story writing that the world's perhaps ever known, and in this country, and in England. Um, it's all part of trying to find an alternative parallel reality which human beings need, because we cannot live by either bread or the, the, the daily boring material world that surrounds us. Mm. We, human beings are above all imaginative creatures, and they can't live just by um, reading the newspapers and plodding around. They have to w create Miyazaki fantasy Japanese type worlds in parallel with this one. And some do it with games, some do it with novels, some do it with television, and some do it with ghost stories.